people excited about quantum technology. Um, they know that China's doing interesting things. Um, but it sounds a little bit like magic. Uh, part of that's the nature of quantum physics, which is a little bit strange, um, but also that it's, it's hard technically to understand. Um, we're very fortunate today that we have Dr. Michael Biersig, um, who is a, a serious technical expert on this. He's going to give a presentation about, um, you know, to, to us, right? To not everyone in the room, uh, I presume, is a quantum physicist, right? Uh, I know what this technology is and what it means for national security. If you've not seen his recent piece on War on the Rocks, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, we have some hard copies around, and it's, uh, it's a great kind of primer on this topic. Um, Dr. Bursic is a professor of quantum physics and quantum technology at the University of Sydney. Um, he's also the CEO and founder of Q Control, a quantum technology company. So he's in a great place to talk about this topic and uh, help us understand it better. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks all, uh, for all of you for attending. Um, are there any quantum physicists in the room? There's one. Sorry, you're going to be disappointed because this is going to be a pretty general overview. Um, I am excited to, to get to present to this kind of audience uh, because part of my background is I did come through the national security apparatus in the US government. I worked at DARPA for a number of years as a technical consultant focused on topics relating to quantum technology and, and other uh, uh, technical applications. Today, I want to give a kind of overview of what quantum technology is, what some of the basic concepts are, and then I want to talk about some of the applications in the national security space that would be of interest to this audience. And, and really the motivation for everything I'll tell you about in this kind of first 30 minutes, and then we'll open it to questions, is the statement that quantum technology which harnesses quantum physics as a resource will be as transformational in the 21st century as harnessing electricity was I mean that seriously, I'm not just selling my own book, and I'll try and uh, give you some insights into why we think this uh, technology can have such significant impacts. So as, as mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of Sydney, where I run a research team called the Quantum Control Laboratory. I also recently founded a venture capital-backed startup called Q-Control, where we're looking to commercialize some of the work that my research team does. So to get started, I want to set the stage by helping you understand the relationship between this futuristic <coughs> technology we'll be talking about and where we are today. Because there's often a lot of confusion about this. This is obviously a, a picture of microprocessors. These are the fundamental things that make all of our information technology work broadly applicable in pretty much everything that we touch on a daily basis. And of course, that carries over to national security if we're talking about C4 ISR and related things. These are devices that you may not know, work because of quantum physics. These are devices made from materials called semiconductors, which either behave like an electrical conductor, allowing electricity to flow, or like an electrical insulator, preventing the flow of electricity, depending on the application of another electrical signal. Controlling the flow of electricity with electricity is the fundamental capability that has given us the information revolution and it comes because of our understanding of quantum physics. Now, these things are really quite profound. They're remarkable pieces of technology. The most modern ones will allow us to have over a billion switching elements called transistors and a chip roughly the size of your thumb now. It's absolutely a technical marvel. But in terms of quantum technology, this is what we sometimes call the first quantum revolution where it's really a rudimentary level of control that we're able to exert over the system in terms of quantum mechanics. So the analogy that we use is that building this kind of technology is a little bit like building this. You can start with bulk material, a giant pile of sand, and you can learn the right rules to sculpt magnificent forms. Just like you can sculpt a billion transistors onto the surface of a semiconductor chip. You can do really profound and remarkable things with this kind of approach. But it shouldn't escape your understanding that if instead of looking at the bulk properties, at the giant pile of sand, if instead you were able to look at the individual grains of sand, you would see a level of complexity that is just not present in the giant pile. Instead of sand that's kind of a homogeneous tan, you see that there's huge color variation from white all the way to red. You see that some of the grains of sand are pieces of seashell, some are stone, some are transparent, some are opaque. All of this complexity is washed out 
when you only look at the giant pile of sand. And the way we build our technology today, even though we're leveraging quantum physics and semiconductor technology, is like building the sand sculpture from the giant pile of sand. So if instead we look at the opportunity to examine and then ex exploit the individual grains of sand technologically, we have really profound new applications. So the idea is to go all the way down to the base level where we start examining how we can control individual quantum systems. This is something that we call the second quantum revolution. The idea not of examining and harnessing only the bulk properties of quantum mechanics, but this new level of complexity that emerges when we gain access to this individual grain of sand. And before any of you kind of laugh at the notion of building technology from fundamental particles that obey the rules of quantum mechanics like atoms, I'll show you this. That's a picture, a photograph, of one atom of a species called euterbium in my laboratory. That's one atom floating in space in something called an ion trap, where if we shine on a laser of just the right color, the light bounces off and you can take a picture. It's a real photograph of one atom. Now what's really exciting is that with this kind of technology, we get down to the level where we're now able to access the individual grain of sand. We're able to access the new complexity that arises when we have access to systems on this scale because the picture that we have of atoms and other particles like electrons as billiard balls that bounce off each other or off the walls is wrong. It breaks down at these tiny scales. And we have to replace it with a picture in which we conceive of them more like waves. Waves that can spread out in space in something called quantum superposition. Waves that interfere with each other or even with themselves. And on these scales, nature even appears to possess a little of what I'll refer to as magic. The idea that quantum systems can exhibit what's called entanglement, a link that is not describable by classical conventional physics, such that if you take an entangled pair, you separate them the distance of the universe, you manipulate one, the other instantly is affected. We fundamentally don't understand why this works. All we know is that now it's real. Because these phenomena were derided by the greatest minds of the 20th century. The people who invented the field of quantum mechanics thought all of this was simply incorrect. Einstein famously called entanglement spooky action at a distance, in a pejorative way. And even Schrodinger, who was one of the fathers of the field, <coughs> dreamed up a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment, that many of you will have heard of in the popular press, called Schrodinger's cat. He set up a framework in which, according to the rules of quantum mechanics, under his thought experiment, you would result in a situation in which a cat could not be described as being alive or dead, but both at the same time. This is Schrodinger's cat. It's a famous parable now that was used originally to show that quantum mechanics was nonsense, that it couldn't be true, that despite this weird math, it was not a physical description of reality. And what we've learned over the intervening period is that that's not correct. That in fact, this is the appropriate mathematical representation of what's going on. And in our vernacular, we struggle to explain what's happening in this system by saying it's alive and dead at the same time. English is not appropriate for quantum mechanics. That mathematical representation is. So we often struggle with that disconnect. But we now know, going back to work from the 1980s and 1990s, that resulted, for instance, in Dave Wineland and Serge Hiroche winning the Nobel Prize in 2012. Dave Wineland was my supervisor when I was at NIST in Boulder. That when we access the individual grains of sand, the individual atoms or other subatomic particles, this physics becomes apparent and accessible and controllable in the laboratory. And so over the intervening decades, there's been a move to try and understand how we can exploit that unusual physics, which we now know is real and is completely absent in today's technology, for new applications. And we saw just in March this year that The Economist, which is not exactly a uh, very forward-looking uh, uh, journal in terms of making speculative claims about technology, even featured quantum technology on the cover as part of its quarterly essay on new technologies. And our team was featured in this for one particular application, which is quantum computing, that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. 
But to understand the space of what quantum technology can do, it's actually useful to look at one document that's gotten a little bit of a ahead of the US apparatus, uh, which is the, in my view, unfortunately named Quantum Manifesto from the European Union, where in about 2014, 2015, they put out a document about research funding. This is, this is not a national security document, it's a research funding document that underpinned a billion dollar, inve a billion euro investment in uh, this kind of field, where they showed a progression of different technologies from effectively today out to 20 years from now, and how, that they, how they would support them. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on, on three. So those are atomic clocks, quantum sensors, and quantum computers. But there's a fundamental link that all of them are based on the same thing. Now, I don't mean they're all just based on quantum physics, because of course they are. They're based on fundamental units of technology that are all pretty much the same. So as we start describing how some of the basic things work in terms of atomic clocks or in terms of quantum sensors, all of that same physics carries over to this much more profound and impactful application of quantum computing. One thing I would like to say is that while I don't have time to survey all possible ways to realize quantum technology. There are broadly two classes of system that we use. Sometimes we use real atoms, like in my lab we actually trap individual atoms and we can control them with lasers and microwave systems. But we also build synthetic atoms. We build synthetic systems that obey the same rules. There are various ways you can do this. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about how this happens. But this is the general paradigm. And all of the physics that I'll talk about, all of the applications that I talk about, cross over between these two approaches to building technology. One concept that's really fundamental to all of the technologies that I'll talk about today is a relationship between physical reality and quantum mechanics and this cartoon. All of you have seen a cartoon like this trying to represent an atom, right? an atom which has a central nucleus and then electrons that whiz around in these orbits. Now this is obviously not the reality of how matter is described, but it's a cartoon representation of things that are real in quantum physics. The idea that the electron, this outer part of the atom, can be here but not here, or here but not here, that's quantum physics. These two things that I've drawn in quantum mechanics are distinguishable. You see that the electron here is whizzing around that way, and the electron here is whizzing around that way. They're different. And in general, they have different energies. One is more energetic than the other. There is a link in quantum physics between energy and time. That this energy difference can be linked to a frequency, a period of oscillation. And with that period of oscillation, we now have something by which we can measure time. Atomic clocks use this plus the quantum physics of superposition to gain access to this clock. A clock which is given to us by the laws of quantum physics, by the laws of nature. Right? Atoms are not synthetic in this sense. And they give us really profound applications or profound capabilities. This is a picture that some of you may have seen before of the NIST F1 atomic fountain clock. This is the atomic clock if you, if you like to use the definite article on it. This is a system that gives us an extremely stable tick based on leveraging this correspondence between energy and time and atoms and then using quantum superposition. It's a clock that's so stable that it will lose only about a second in 80 million years. And there's a new generation of research grade clocks being driven by groups at NIST and other places in the world that are good to about a second in a million years. They use quantum entanglement as well as quantum superposition in order to give these performance boosts. Now, I'm sure some of you will say, why do I care? I'll long be dead before I lose a second. But on shorter time scales, this kind of regularity in the tick of the clock gives us capabilities that are germane to national security. One application that has touched all of you is GPS, because the regularity of that tick in atomic clocks is how GPS works. The ability to distinguish when a signal arrives from a satellite is how we can do geolocation. And it's the same principle that sailors used in the 17th century to navigate on 
uh, notions. But the regularity of that tick also gives other capabilities. And one of those other capabilities touches on this idea of making sensors. Because when you have a clock that's extremely stable, it also becomes a very good detector of extremely small disturbances. This is an experiment from NIST that was really quite profound. They showed that with a single atom atomic clock, one atom like the photo I showed you, it's a different species, the clock ticked so regularly that they were able to detect the change in that ticking period by lifting it 17 centimeters. Because gravity changes as you move away from the surface of the Earth, or the center of the Earth. That's how sensitive these devices are. It's something that comes because of our access to quantum physics. The trade-off that you get in leveraging this kind of technology for sensing goes in three different ways. You can always detect smaller signals, a fainter signal. You can detect the same signal in less time because of something called the sensitivity, which is really saying how big a signal can I detect in a second. With, there's, with noise in the background. And I can detect the same signals, the same signatures from greater distances. This is already getting attention because just in June this year, there was a little bit of discussion in the media about applications of quantum technology in, in China relating to what are called tensor magnetic radiometers based on synthetic quantum systems called SQUIDs, superconducting quantum interference devices that are very sensitive magnetometers. And it was postulated by an analyst who read a technical article in a uh, Society of Geophysicists letter that this system would allow standoff detection of submarines at heights of about a, a kilometer above the surface of the water, right? which is an enormous change from magnetic anomaly detection that's currently undertaken, which is more like a few hundred meters at most above the surface of the water. Now, this idea of using magnetic signatures of submarine vessels dates all the way back to World War II. We used to tow uh, magnetic field detectors behind, uh, behind aircraft. But now the sensitivity increases are allowing the capability or the possibility to do the detection from higher distance, from greater altitudes, and to detect fainter signals, which of course means potentially deeper subs. There's a range of other sensing applications. I'm not going to survey them. I just wanted to give uh, a little bit of an overview. We can do, uh, in principle, hardened structure or underground void detection using either magnetic signatures or gravitational signatures. As I mentioned, submarine magnetometry or gravimetry, and also geodesy. So, so some really beautiful work that comes out of NASA comes from what's called the GRACE mission. The GRACE mission, is, it's not quantum technology, but my postulation is the next generation uh, could be powered this way. The GRACE mission enables <coughs> the detection of changes in the Earth's gravity with reasonable spatial resolution, as you see here, where if you do the same measurement at different times of, say, the year or over different years, the only thing that really fundamentally changes is how much water there is in aquifers. So this was a study by the GRACE mission that showed a huge deficit associated with the drought in California that only recently broke. Now the idea, of course, is that the, res the spatial resolution and the sensitivity in terms of changes to the gravitational signal can be augmented by this next generation of quantum-enabled sensors that I've been talking about so far. Now I want to change gears just a little bit and tell you about an application that most of you will have heard of uh, in the popular press, that is quantum computing. The idea of processing information using the kind of physics that I told you about in the beginning of the talk. So I want to ask you a math problem that really sets up the whole field of quantum computing as it exists today. Given one number, a target number, tell me the two numbers that are divisible only by one in themselves that you multiply together to get that number. So if I tell you 15, you tell me? Yes. Let's do another one. Seven and three. One more? <laughs> so it, it looks ridiculous, right? It's a cutesy joke. But the fact is the only reason all of us were able to answer the first two was because we memorized them when we were children. We memorized multiplication tables. This problem, finding the prime factors of a large number, is hard not just for people, but also for computers. In fact, it is so hard for computers that this idea, finding the prime factors of long bit strings of large numbers, 
is fundamentally what gives us security in all what are called public key crypto systems. If you ever use a browser that says HTTPS, if you ever use a STU or a STI, you're using public key crypto systems. You are relying on the fact that this math problem is really hard for computers. In fact, it's so hard that in many cases it's postulated that it would take longer than the age of the universe to crack some of these uh, encryption algorithms. Now that kind of changed in the mid-1990s with this guy. His name is Peter Shore. At the time, he was at AT&T Labs in New Jersey. He's now at MIT. What he did was write down an algorithm that said, if you have access to a computer which can encode information using quantum physics of the sort I've been talking about so far, then you can run an algorithm that allows this particular problem to be solved exponentially faster than any competitive classical algorithm that we know of today. And that was obviously a huge thing. It was a big motivator for the security apparatus in the United States. It led the National Security Agency to begin their first ever university-based research effort, trying to ask the question of whether this kind of system could in fact be built. It led to an agency, a sub-agency called ARDA, that's since transformed into a variety of other agencies. Now it's IARPA in some form. All asking the question of whether this could be done. This was the birth of the modern field of quantum computing. And I want to explain for a minute how it works. We can go back to this cartoon representation of atoms, where I told you before that the electron going around this way and the electron going around this way, they're distinguishable, they're different. Well, now I can just assign a one or a zero and have a way to encode information that's a little bit similar to the way we encode information in classical bits. This is something we call a qubit, a quantum bit. It can be one or it can be zero. But because of the rules of quantum mechanics, we know it can be one and zero at the same time in this vernacular language. And to borrow a joke from Dave Weinland, this was something that they realized in the lab and called Schrodinger's kitten. The idea that at the single atom level, you can realize this unusual physics of quantum superposition. If you can do it with the atom drawn that way, you can also do it with information. You can make information that can be represented as superpositions of one and zero at the same time in our vernacular language. The power of this capability really comes clear when we start thinking about more than one quantum bit. Let's go to a byte. Let's think about one classical byte, eight bits. We know that with that eight bit system, we can represent one eight bit number, that is one number between zero and 255, that's two to the eight minus one, any, any number. Here, I've just chosen one. If instead we use quantum bits and exploit both superposition and entanglement, an eight qubit quantum byte allows us to represent all 256, all two to the eight possibilities at the same time. Now, I've only drawn a quarter of the possible information space. The idea, of course, is that by representing information in this way, there is what is broadly and kind of incorrectly referred to as parallelism in the quantum system. The real trick is that understanding what to do with this is a very hard problem. Understanding how to put that enormous information capacity to work to solve useful problems is the subject of a field called quantum algorithm design. There are only a few algorithms that have been devised. Shor's algorithm is uh, one of the best known, the one I talked about a moment ago for factoring. Others are emerging now. Turning this into something useful remains an open problem, but it shouldn't be too hard to understand that it could, in principle, be very powerful. In fact, that argument has convinced some pretty serious places, like the Information Assurance Directorate of the NSA, which oversees the national security suite of, of uh, cryptographic algorithms, to issue an FAQ about quantum computing in which it said the potential impact of adversarial use of a quantum computer is known, and without effective mitigation is devastating to the NSS. Again, not an agency that tends to brag too much or to overstate what they perceive as security risks. Now what's happened is that since the real effort in building Shor's algorithm processors uh, commenced, we've learned that the challenge of making these systems at scales that are relevant to actually cracking codes is probably much harder than we originally expected. There was a 
uh, really nice academic paper that a couple of years ago estimated how big a system you would require and how long it would take to factor a 2048-bit number, which is what we use if you have an RSA token. And the number of qubits was between 50 million and 3 trillion. And remember, you have about a billion transistors on today's most advanced microprocessors. We're now talking about something maybe a thousand times more complicated than that in order to run Shor's algorithm at a scale that matters. For comparison of where we are kind of today, we're talking about systems like this. Today's most advanced processors are right around here, between 16 and 20 quantum bits. In the last couple of years, we've seen big media around five qubit devices from IBM and INQ. IBM just recently had a lot of press about a 22 quantum bit device. IBM and Google have been uh, publishing battling press releases about eventually making a 50 quantum bit device. And then my projection is that in the next seven to 10 years, we'll be at a scale of roughly 1,000 quantum bits. Roughly 1,000 quantum bits is roughly a billion times smaller than you would require to run Shor's algorithm in that kind of worst case scenario. So it remains a long way to go before we have systems that are relevant <coughs> for factoring. But that technical challenge has been a huge motivator for our research community, and it's pushed a lot of people in algorithm design to think about new applications that may work on much smaller computers and could have equally profound impacts in the national security space. This is work that comes from a team based at ETH Zurich and Microsoft in Redmond that looks at what we now consider to be the most likely killer app for small-scale quantum computers. This paper postulates that with a system of about 1,000 qubits, about the size I postulate in seven to 10 years will be a reality, that they can attack problems in chemistry that are very hard for conventional computers. Because chemistry, of course, is a process governed by the rules of quantum physics. It's electrons interacting in chemical reactions. That's very hard to model with conventional systems. And when you get up to reasonably complicated molecules, it's pretty much just impossible. One problem that falls into this category is something called nitrogen fixation. So it's making ammonia-based fertilizer. Making fertilizer is currently done using what's called the Haber-Bosch process, which is about 120 years old, and it consumes roughly 6% of the Earth's natural gas output every year, just making fertilizer. It's extremely inefficient, extremely energy intensive, because we don't have a good catalyst. We don't have a good accelerator for this reaction. And yet biological systems do this all the time. We just don't know how. This team suggested that with a small-scale quantum computer, it may be able, we may be able, to model this reaction in order to gain insights into how we can make catalysts that kind of mimic biological systems for nitrogen fixation. Huge impacts on food security and the like. Another application that I just want to highlight very briefly is machine learning. It is becoming apparent that quantum systems can be accelerators in machine learning, just like graphical processing units have been for deep learning networks. The idea of quantum computers as coprocessors or accelerators for machine learning tasks is gaining traction in our community. Exactly what the space of applications is, exactly how the algorithms will be designed and will function, remains very much a research question. But the early indications are that this also could be a high impact application space well in advance of any shores factoring algorithm. Now, these applications have been very motivational to big corporate players. We've seen a change in the community from just academic teams, largely funded by agencies like the NSA and the Army Research Office in the United States through big programs that I've been part of for a number of years, over towards big commercial investments from the giants, Microsoft, Google, IBM, largely in university partnerships. So Microsoft, in the last couple of years, has made investments all around the world, including a team at Sydney that's run by a colleague of mine named David Riley. Google bought a team at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and just brought them into Google. IBM has had a large quasi-academic effort for several decades in this field, but has really ramped up in the last three to five years as overall interest in commercial applications has increased. But it's not just the corporates. We also see now a growth of venture capital-based companies that are working in the space. On the left, I'm highlighting a couple of hardware manufacturers. IonQ is based out of the University of Maryland. It's local. Uh, and on the right, some software companies. And then in the middle is the company that, that 
I have founded, which is bridging the hardware-software divide, dealing with one particular technical problem to try and make quantum computers commercially viable. An interesting side note is that right now, all of you can go for free and log on to a real quantum computer that is operating in Yorktown Heights. This is run by IBM. It's called the IBM Quantum Experience. It's a small system. The, the one that's currently accessible is five qubits. They're just bringing online their 22 qubit device. It's really no more than a toy in terms of what it can do, but it's really an amazing piece of hardware in terms of helping our community start doing algorithm development. Because if you just take a step back and imagine trying to write computer code for Java or C or whatever with pen and paper instead of on a computer, it's a very daunting task. Now we suddenly have real hardware, although the hardware does not perform particularly well. One thing that we hear about a lot as kind of a final technical note is something called quantum supremacy. You hear this in the popular media because Google has been making a very big push on achieving quantum supremacy. The idea that at some point they will build a system where the computational capability of their small quantum computer will exceed the best classical alternative, the best supercomputer you could throw at the same problem. Computer scientists have postulated that that transition comes roughly around 50 quantum bits. That this changeover between what the thing on the left can do and the thing on the right can do is roughly 50, which is in the time scale of the next couple of years. The important caveat is that computer scientists and quantum computer scientists have really been contorting themselves to come up with problems that give quantum supremacy an edge, that actually work better on a quantum computer than they do on a classical computer. So a very important takeaway is that quantum supremacy does not equal utility. If you build a quantum computer that achieves quantum supremacy, it is a an essential technical milestone in our research discipline. But it does not mean that that system can either do anything that you would ever want to do, other than some esoteric math problem that computer scientists cooked up for this application, or that the path to large-scale, useful quantum computers is any clearer. So please don't be confused by the hype. It is an important milestone, but it is not the be-all, end-all of our research discipline. I want to leave you with one thought, which is, this is a quantum computer made of trapped ions running a small algorithm. It's about 20 quantum bits. It's work done by my research fellow, a postdoctoral research fellow, Cornelius Humpel, when he was at the University of Innsbruck, another big global leader in this space. If you squint a little bit at that device, where each blue dot is one atom, maybe it looks a little bit like some systems that you would see from the 1950s. The point is that on the tech technological arc of development for quantum computers, we're in very, very early stages. The systems we're building are very simple, they're extremely large, they don't really do very much. But the trajectory towards useful quantum computers is accelerating. As smart people start thinking about algorithms that can run on much, much smaller systems, kind of being forced by the challenge of building large-scale factoring engines, and how resource-intensive that is. And I think we'll be seeing actual applications of real quantum computers in, within this next decade. But what is most exciting to me as a scientist is that if you look through history, especially in the development of computer technology, you see that the applications that are most profound are the ones that are least anticipated. I think quantum computers fall squarely in this category, and it's a really exciting time to be working in this field. So I hope you've gotten some insights into how this technology works, some of the new applications that have impact on national security, and some of the realistic caveats about where we stand and where we're going. So with that, I'll just happily open to questions from the audience. Is it, for the end user, is it simple just to think of this as a very powerful version of what regular computers can already do? Uh, my specific question is, on the slide where you showed uh, 256 bits being represented in one bit at the same time, uh, that seemed to leave the impression you were only getting an advantage of 256 times as much information, which seems like it must be an understatement of what this actually achieves. I mean, you're, you're getting a lot more than that, but I didn't quite understand how. So let me, let me answer the specific question first. The specific question relates to this. Um, for n quantum bits, where n can be any number, maybe it's 8, like here, maybe it's 1,000, 
the advantage in scaling goes like 2 to the n. It's an exponential increase in the information capacity. So here, 2 to the 8 is 256. If you have 8 quantum bits, you have 256 times more information. If you have 1,000 quantum bits, it's 2 to the 1,000. An important you know, kind of scale to set there is if you have 300 quantum bits, 2 to the 300 is about 10 to the 100, which is a Google, which is a number so large that if you tried to build a conventional computer that could represent, just like I've written out all the possibilities here, if you tried to represent all 2 to the 100 possibilities, you would run out of matter in the universe before you could build that system. That's with just 300 quantum bits. So the scaling is, uh, well, this exponential scaling is quite important in terms of the general capabilities. Of course, as I said, understanding how to leverage that information capacity is a challenging problem in algorithm design. Because we only get one n bit number out at the end. When we measure, we destroy all the quantum bits. Uh, to, your, to your more general question, um, I think that's maybe more philosophical than anything. Um, if you have a clock in your computer that runs at a gigahertz or something, do you care what defines that clock? Do you care if it's a quartz oscillator or a BBA oscillator or if it's a voltage controlled oscillator? I think at some level, technological users are able to abstract away what is giving the performance advantage and just take advantage of that performance. Quantum computers may be similar. Uh, it may be that for a long time they'll only be mainframes and cloud-based, and it may be that in the longer term we understand how to make them stable enough to be deployable, and then it just becomes a little black box, probably honestly as black box as any microprocessor is to a generic user. The, the slide you had on uh, speculating about Chinese developments with you know, underwater quantum sensing was frankly eye-opening. Wondering if you have the impression that potentially adversarial countries like China and Russia are more advanced than the U.S. defense industry when it comes to applying quantum technology to uh, sensing or other defense technologies. And a related question, when it comes to the farthest you know, advances in quantum computing, is the knowledge relatively shareable, transferable, open source, or is it very proprietary? For example, if, if Microsoft or Google or um, others make an advance, do they, do they tend to share that with the academic community, or do they keep it pr pr proprietary control over it um, so that nobody else will be able to catch up on it? One important idea that I want to leave you with is that the advances we're seeing in quantum computing are not because of the entrance of corporates. Corporates are entering because academics are making big advances. and so. Mostly, these big corporates, Microsoft and Google and IBM, are buying academics, bringing them into their corporate structure. And our nature, I would say, is broadly to share as much as possible. Now, I don't have detailed insights into how these companies work, but broadly, at a, at a you know, prima facie level, they're quite open about sharing what's going on because it's at such an early stage of the development. It doesn't make sense to try and lock things up. Um, and I would say that will probably continue for some time. I'm sure they'll do some things behind the curtain. Uh, as for China, um, for a long time China has lagged very significantly in quantum technology, except in one very specific application, that is quantum communications, which I didn't talk about today. What they've started to do is buy back scientists who have gone and spent time in the West, and so they just bought back a gentleman who was working at Google, as far as I understand, in this, in this real leading edge team. And they went from no publications in the, the special field of superconducting quantum computing to having characterization of a system that rivaled the current Google prototype in about three years. Um, how that will expand, I don't know. Um, if they keep buying back, it's, it's a risk, uh, honestly. Um, right now, I mean, I know we speak about adversarial nations, but the fact is that from a research perspective, this is very open and collaborative. It is very much a global effort. We try not to build walls, again, because it's so early. Uh, for Russia, Russia has been quite silent for many years. Throughout the development of quantum information, there has been nothing, really. Uh, and just recently, there was a link on a paper from Harvard to what's now called the Russian Quantum Center, which not a lot of people know about. I mean, I, don't, I didn't know very much about it before this announcement. But there's one academic at Harvard named Misha Lukin who kind of bridges both worlds back in Russia and, and at Harvard. Um, how much work is actually going on in Russia is not clear. By contrast, China just announced this $10 billion investment in quantum technology. Billion with a B. Um, 
back in uh, 2003 in the journal ACM, Shore had a paper with the title, uh, Why Have More Quantum Algorithms Been Discovered? Right? And uh, the classes of algorithms in that paper, uh, quantum Fourier, Fourier techniques, um, amplitude amplification, um, Grover, Shore's, those are still the examples we use today. Um, let me ask you the same question that he asked in his title Why haven't there been more quantum algorithms? And where is the next big idea in terms of the algorithmic application of these cool physics? So, so the hard part is that you know, I, I've clearly glossed over this in some way. It's a very profound question. Why are there not more quantum algorithms today? Um, to summarize the process, you take n bits of information, you put them into a quantum computer, you can make this information space of 2 to the n, right? possible pathways, if you will. But then at the end, you do a measurement, and you only get n bits out. You destroy the quantumness when you measure the quantum computer. So you go from classical to quantum back to classical, because it's the classical information that you need to use. That means that the algorithm design has to be robust against that challenge. So far, Shore is one of the few that has shown uh, that you can actually fully utilize this exponentially large information space. Not even the Grover search algorithm does. It gives only a quadratic improvement, and it does need only case that kind of problems. What we've now seen is that chemistry which has the same state space as the computer in terms of uh, this exponential scaling, is what we believe is the most likely killer app. So the, uh, the uh, uh, Journal of American Chemical Society or some other chemical society journal just had on its cover the idea that quantum computing is, is going to be the newest tool in computational chemistry. Uh, that material science and broadly a class of what we call quantum simulation, building quantum scale models of problems that are very hard for classical machines, like um, like building a scale model of an aircraft in a wind tunnel, that kind of approach is what we think will, will give some benefits. So I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about quantum machine learning and what specifically the short, short and longer term uh, potential is there, and also uh, what, what there are the trends, and in terms of long term trajectories of developments more broadly. I'd be curious to hear what you think, so my understanding is that the uh, China's national a laboratory for quantum information science, just uh, just, so to speak, a one billion out of ten billion dollar investment, but certainly the overall figure could be in the billions or tens of billions, but the your remarks seem to indicate that perhaps human capital is the more critical factor here, that large amounts of investment only get you so far that people will be more valuable longer term, and certainly that is an area where, as you mentioned, Chinese government is very actively through national talent plans and other means trying to recruit and bring back top scientists, but also collaborating with uh, the Austrian Academy of Sciences on this quantum communications project of anti-Zylanders to another. So curious to hear your thoughts on uh, quantum machine learning, first of all, which actually was highlighted as a priority in China's new generation and development plan. And secondly, uh, what, uh, beyond capital and, uh, and overall level investments, what sort of resources do you think will be important, or what sort of indicators do you see as uh, meaningful longer term in terms of longer term trajectories of development? Those are, those are excellent questions. Uh, to China first, um, I, I think that we have seen there are significant limits. When I was at DARPA, this was true, that um, of how much throwing money at a problem can really solve problems that require creative solutions. This is, despite some of the change in language, for instance, in this economist piece, that this is now engineering, that's, that's what was written there. It's, I think it's just fundamentally not true. There, are, there is a new need for engineering. There is a new need for a different approach beyond just basic science to solve some of these problems that tax this trajectory question you were, you were asking. Um, but it is not just engineering. There are many very challenging, quasi-fundamental problems that remain in how we solve these problems. We're not going to build, I think, in any short term, a three trillion qubit system. So maybe we need to ask some more fundamental questions about other approaches. Right? Um, because of that, throwing money at the problem doesn't solve it. It becomes talent. Now, if, if China or any other nation is able to attract and retain significant talent by throwing money at them, now that's, that's an indirect route. But just capital and whatnot is not the, the bottleneck now. Um, for quantum machine learning, uh, you know, the, there, in, this, in this lovely paper in Nature, there are a few different applications that are laid out. Um, you know, my group used machine learning for stabilizing quantum systems. People are thinking about using machine learning to learn about quantum systems or to learn about classical systems. Uh, the, the ETH and uh, Microsoft collaboration recently showed that there are some very deep links between the functionality of deep neural networks 
and large-scale entangled systems, but they could use deep neural networks to do simulations of, of entangled quantum systems, which are very challenging, and so it may go both ways. Uh, but I would broadly say it is a new and emerging area of interest as opposed to a well-developed one with a very clear trajectory of how uh, quantum machine learning would be applied. Let's go to the back of the room. Yes. So, so sorry. Uh, everything we talked about is kind of macroscopic scale still at this point. And if you think about transistors, they're running into a problem because of quantum tunneling. Do you think as the number of qubits shrinks and as the technology advances, that quantum vacuum fluctuations will create a similar problem for qubits? Um, well, let me, let me first probe your, the first one of your question, the macroscopic nature. Mm -hmm. One atom, I would not quite say it's macroscopic. The atom is, uh, it's, it has a wave function that spans roughly 10 nanometers. So that's of order the same size as the transistors that you're talking about in today's most advanced uh, process flows. Um, when you're talking about systems like the superconducting qubits at IBM or Google, they happen to be larger uh, physically, in terms of physical dimensions, but still you're only talking about kind of one quantum mechanical degree of freedom that's being exploited. So I think that the analogy breaks down a little bit despite the physical size scales. Um, in, terms of, in terms of things that limit quantum computers, um, well, quantum vacuum fluctuations are an example of what's generally called uncertainty, right? That, uh, uh, you know, in many of these systems we use what are called quantum harmonic oscillators. So imagine a pendulum, the quantum mechanical version of a pendulum. There is a ground state energy associated with that. It is an important thing to consider, but it is not necessarily a fundamental limitation. The broader limitation comes from decoherence, right? This, this phenomenon that I just didn't talk about because of time, whereby quantum systems interact with their environments and they degrade, they become classical again. Uh, this is a very significant problem. Um, Q-Control, in fact, focuses on addressing this problem and making quantum systems that are more robust against decoherence. It is the primary driver for effectively all research investment that has gone on to date in quantum computing. It's all about suppressing decoherence. So there are these fundamental limitations. I don't think they quite come from the size scales in, in, in quite that analogous fashion. Well, thank you for your talk. Um, I just had a question about um, if you could possibly elaborate on the um, defense applications involving the uh, Chinese sensor capability in the South China Sea. I know you discussed that briefly, but um, I was hoping, because since I'm not a quantum mechanics expert, it's not my cup of tea, but I was just hoping that you could elaborate more on the specifics of how their sensors would be enhanced um, in that capacity. Sure. So I, I want to I make it clear, it, it is not only the Chinese who have come up with some crazy magnetometer that no one else has. Um, there, there is a class of magnetometer which is based on what's called a superconducting quantum interference device, the SQUID. They go back to the 60s, 1964, 1965, they were first developed. Uh, they're loops of a special material called a superconductor that allows electricity to flow with no resistance. And if you construct them the right way with a special little weak point in them, then they become sensitive to magnetic fields in, in a very particular way. Right? So you can, you can build circuits, integrate these. They're very widely used. Use them in, in biological uh, magnetometry. Uh, they have been used in magnetometry for technical applications very broadly. What this particular team did was, from my understanding, I'm not an expert in what they were doing, uh, they made an array of these squid-based magnetometers. I believe, although I'm not certain, that they were made of a material called a high-temperature superconductor which superconducts at slightly elevated temperatures. It's still cold. It's still really cold and very challenging technologically. Um, with that array, they were able to get rid of the kind of common mode background noise that comes from, for instance, putting on an aircraft. Right? If, you put a, if you put a really sensitive magnetic detector next to a really big magnetic thing, whatever that big magnetic thing is dominates your signal. So by having this array, they're able to reject the common mode signal and detect changes in space and in time. So by, again, having an array, they get information not just about the vector magnetic field, that is x, y, z, where does the field point, but also it's called a tensor, mag tensor gradient magnetometer, also changes in that vector field, where does it point, across the array. Um, because it's a squid, it's very sensitive, a squid-based device, it's very sensitive, 
because it's in this array configuration, it gets rid of the common mode noise, so it makes it more useful. They then did a demonstration that they could put it on a helicopter, as far as I recall, and uh, do flyovers for um, geomagnetic anomalies in, uh, in mining. It was, a, it was a geological survey, but then it was an analyst after the fact who said, wait a minute, you could use this for, for submarine detection. Thanks. I'm Mike Clouser with Fujitsu. Um, so two questions. My understanding is that to run a computer in a state, it requires extremely low temperature, something like negative 200 something like Kelvin. So could you talk about the power necessary uh, and energy consumption for quantum computing and the costs? And also, I was wondering, does, uh, does North Wall hold the quantum computing, or is, has there, has there been a new sort of time frame, North Law, that's sort of emerged on quantum development? Um, OK, these are great questions. Uh, so the first one is about how cold the systems need to be. Uh, broadly, yes, the systems need to be cooled. If, if it's the kind of system that IBM is operating, they have to be cooled in what's called a dilution refrigerator to fractions of a degree above absolute zero. If you're dealing with a trapped ion computer like I'm talking about, the whole system macroscopically is hot at room temperature, but we use lasers to cool the atoms to actually much lower temperatures. Uh, these are not efficient systems. These are you know, laboratory scale giant systems that consume many, many kilowatts to have just a few quantum bits. Uh, you know, in some respects, that's similar to what we've seen in the development of, of large-scale computers from the ENIAC forward. Uh, I think this idea of power dissipation will be one that gets addressed as we move into more engineering focus. Um, sorry, your second question was? Moore's Law. Moore's Law. Yeah. Um, so, so the first thing to say is quantum computing is not a drop-in replacement for the next generation of roadmap planning in ITRS or something. That, it, that's, I know that's said frequently, but it's not true, right? Uh, if there is a full death of Moore's Law, uh, for the first thing to say is if Moore's Law falters, like nobody cares. It's just the industry enforcing on itself competition. It's not, it's not real. It's not fundamental. It's, it's market. Um, if Moore's Law actually absolutely fell apart and we stopped having advances in classical computation, then we would also stop having advances in quantum computers because we need new capabilities in classical computation to make quantum computers work, to power them alongside. Uh, people have been quite cutesy in our field and tried to apply Moore's Law to you know, every aspect of quantum technology, from how long a quantum bit lives to how many quantum bits you can make on a chip. I mean, I think that's, that's more sales pitch than, than anything else. Um, the, the, the message I want to leave you with is we need both. It's not a drop-in replacement. We need advances in classical computing. Quantum computers will be, at least in the nearer term, a kind of uh, coprocessor, an accelerator in the way that GPUs were, graphical processing units were initially. Obviously, we started out doing graphics rendering, and now we do all sorts of insane things with machine learning with GPUs. Quantum computers may face a similar trajectory. Can you talk to cyber resiliency? Uh, based on what you talked about with regards to Shora's algorithm, and uh, what NIST said last year in their statement uh, regarding uh, cyber resiliency uh, with regards to quantum uh, threats, you know, they're saying within 10 years, companies should be looking at becoming quantum resilient. But based on what you're saying, that seems like it's overly, uh, you know, not necessarily on track. So can you discuss that? Uh, sure. So I guess the general idea is when are we going to have a quantum computer that matters um, for, for, for factoring. Um, you know, I can't, I can't attack that question from the perspective of a business that's doing risk mitigation. I can talk about uh, the, technology, the technological development cycle. Um, you know, the, the best information we have today is that you need really big quantum computers to factor numbers of relevance to national security or, or general information security. And that, you know, having been in this field since 2001, uh, it's going to take a while, right? I, Things are moving fast, but they're not moving that fast. I think 10 years is extremely optimistic for having a system that could run Shor's algorithm at a relevant scale. There was a paper just recently, for instance, that maybe some of you saw about Bitcoin, written by some colleagues of mine. It looked at, um, well, they use public key encryption, so if you build a Shor's factoring engine, you can crack the public key encryption, and then blockchain is not secure. I mean, that's, that's kind of a straightforward line of argument. But then they 
uh, try and argue when you'll get to these next generation systems that are sufficiently big. They said something like uh, 10 years, and then if you, you know, there are theorists uh, who do computer science and quantum information theory, I'm an experimentalist, so I went into the appendices to look at how they made their assumptions, and they made a lot of unphysical assumptions, right? So I think, I think it's coming, but I legitimately think it's some decades. Um, if, if the reality is that it's 20 or 30 years before you have a uh, factoring engine that's relevant to cracking public key encryption systems, it may be that 10 years from now, if you're a commercial organization, you need to be quantum resilient. That's, that's somebody else's risk mitigation call. But I would definitely say that I find it extremely unlikely that in the next 10 years, we're suddenly going to have uh, factoring engines. Um, now, the other side of that, quantum resiliency is quantum communications. Um, I only mentioned this briefly in the context of China, but uh, you can build quantum information uh, uh, communication channels that give resilience against hacking, against eavesdropping, using some of the same physics of, of quantum information. Uh, an important caveat is that while all of you will hear in the media that it provides unhackable communications, that is fundamentally untrue. Right? That, is, that is the media interpretation of a very complicated mathematical argument. What you can say about quantum communications is that there is provable security. Right? Now, provable security is easy to turn into perfect security. It's easy to turn into unhackable. Right? Um, provable security has a mathematical meaning in the cryptographic literature. It talks about the likelihood of unexpected eavesdropping. There are benefits that come from using quantum communication channel, but they are not uh, they are not impervious to attack. In fact, there's a whole line of research that looks at developing attacks on quantum key distribution systems, right? So it, it, it's not perfect, but it is a new way of uh, giving encryption resiliency for, so far, the key distribution problem. Thank you. Um, I thought uh, your comment about Throwing money at a problem isn't necessarily the best way to come up with, you know, the most creative ideas. Um, and I'm curious about your thoughts on that because one of the uh, discussions that's kind of one, one of the topics that's sort of dominating policy discussions around this issue is how do you translate basic research outcomes in quantum in in quantum information science uh, to you know, new technological applications. And I'm wondering that, in, you know, if in your time, you know, conducting research in the U.S. and also your time abroad, if you've seen mechanisms that um, are employed elsewhere that facilitate that kind of translation um, in unique and very effective ways, um, and if those are mechanisms that should be uh, considered and maybe even adopted by various federal agencies here, my, my view is that the most successful organization in this space has been the Army Research Office and the National Security Agency. And I mean, I, I have no insight into how they built their program. I only know what I've seen. Right? So I want to make that totally clear. Um, what they have done is focus on bringing into the tent all of the best talent, all around the world. Get all the best people who are doing interesting and clever things, even if they're out there, even if it may not pan out. High risk, high reward profile. Bring that into the program and support that. Now, those people get supported well. They're not shoestring budget. I mean, this is my research. My research program is funded by the ARO and has been for some years. Um, we're not shoestring budget. It is a mission agency that is well capitalized, that is able to support research teams at a level that allows us to advance. So I don't want to give the idea that. Uh, should all be on starvation budgets for research because money doesn't matter. Money does matter, but only throwing money at you know, a collection of people who may not be the right people is not the best approach. Having this global, inclusive, collaborative project that brings all of the best talent that the ARO could find, and it pretty much has had everybody who mattered in the entire global research community going back to the late 1990s. Um, that has been a very successful mechanism. Now, translating that into you know, technological outcomes, I think that happens very naturally uh, because this is, these are mission agencies. They're not funding us 
to kind of understand quantum physics. They are funding us to understand how to build quantum computers and other quantum technologies. Um, so the technological outcomes come naturally. There's a separate question about how you commercialize, right? Um, academics generally are very interested in solving technical problems, not necessarily interested in understanding how to convince a customer to buy their, their product. That's really a cultural thing. Um, there are ways to incentivize that. I'm happy to talk some more about it. I mean, uh, I obviously have made this transition to, to a venture capital backed uh, startup. There are things about it that, that are great and things that suck, frankly. But, uh, but, but I, I think the, the first part of the question is the substantive aspect about uh, building this global collaboration. It's absolutely essential. You cannot wall things off. You cannot take a nationalist perspective in this. It's too early and too high impact, especially if you're a little afraid of foreigners, at least be five eyes, right? Because the five eyes have huge talent in this space. Thanks, Mike, for doing this. Um, you mentioned quantum coherence. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on explaining maybe how that scales to get to larger human systems. Does the decoherence problem scale with n or two to the n, or is that not the right way to think about it? No, it's, it's a great way to think about it, and the answer is we have no idea. Um, if we build a quantum computer that is big, and has in it something called quantum error correction, an algorithmic approach to keep the quantum systems quantum for very long times by identifying and correcting logical errors that occur. If we build that system, we will have created a new state of matter that has never existed. It's a really profound scientific aspect of this. We don't know what happens when you make really large entangled quantum systems. We don't see them around. The idea of persistent quantum coherence doesn't exist in nature as best we understand. Um, so I think you know there are some very specific examples of, of certain entangled states which decay linearly with a number of entangled qubits, others that don't. You can embed symmetries that, that prevent that from happening, just like you do with something called gray cones in, in classical computing. Um, but it's very much an open question of what happens when the systems get bigger. Michael, can I uh, push back on the comment you made about uh, the timeline to reasonable machines for a factor? Um, if uh, if uh, folks could store data today at some point in time, they can uh, use a big machine when available. So um, from a policy perspective, uh, concern about uh, uh, how quickly we're adopting symmetric or other uh, post-quantum uh, cryptographic techniques in commercial government environments, should that be something we, we're, we're concerned about, regardless of the, the time to machine? Should we, should we have policy today to protect sooner than later? Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't mean to be flippant about, uh, about my answer. I was really addressing the technological time horizon. Absolutely, there is the tactical, uh, well, there is the strategic question of whether information today will be secure in 20 years and whether that matters. Um, I think the likelihood is if, if you ever build a factoring machine that is sufficient even in 20 or 30 years to factor a 2048-bit key, um, that yes, everything that has been encoded using that kind of technology today is insecure. And we all know, as you say, that it's all being stored. Everything is being stored. So indeed, I think it is, it is relevant to think about post-quantum cryptography. This is something that is uh, under kind of research uh, activity right now. Um, I was only addressing the kind of the, when is a quantum computer going to be here. And so that's a very important point. Thanks. Thank you, Mike, uh, for doing this. Um, we've uh, gone over a little bit of time because there's a lot of interest in this topic. Um, I'm sure folks will be around and we'll be pestering with questions afterwards. I'll be here. And um, thank you so much. It's great. Thanks.